Accutron Watches present. From New York City, this is the Accutron Show, a time travel through American culture with your hosts, Bill McCuddy, Scott Alexander, and David Graver. Visit AccutronWatch.com and discover the brand that has made American history with an all-new proprietary next-generation electrostatic energy movement. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. Uh, if you shrink Earth to a schoolroom globe, all right, uh, they went the thickness of two dimes above Earth's surface. Yep, the person you heard at the top of the show was today's guest, and he's got such a resume, I've got to read it to you. He's an American astrophysicist, a planetary scientist, an author, and science communicator. It could only be Neil deGrasse Tyson who joins this special episode of the Accutron Show dedicated to space. But first, it's three guys that take up space every time on this podcast, and uh, we're thrilled to have you join us because we have a special one today. David Graver from Cool Hunting and Scott Alexander, who writes for just about everybody, and we are all kind of on the edge of our seats and didn't sleep last night because, no, Santa didn't come, but Neil deGrasse Tyson is our special guest, and we're going to talk all about space, what we can find, what we can't find, and if there's intelligent life anywhere, are they related to me? <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> All after this, the Accutron Show. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our iconic Space View 2020 collection, recreating the stunning visual impact of the original open dial design combined with an all new electrostatic energy movement. Time just changed again. The Accutron Space View 2020. David, if you had the chance, would you go into space? Immediately. I would. I would I would want to be on one of the first shuttles out just to see, and I would want to go as far as, as possible. I want to explore. I know we don't know enough about Earth or even our oceans, but we look up to the sky and we are inspired, and I want to seek that inspiration out with my yeah, own hands. I, do I want to be in the first Tesla, though? I mean, it, it, I, I don't want, the want bugs to go to space. Right? You don't? I, I don't. What? Space wants to kill you. <laughs> uh, I want to stay alive, so I'd like to stay here on Earth. I did go on a zero-G flight. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. That was one of the most fun things I've ever done. It is a totally wild experience. I recommend it to anybody. It's a little the expensive. Vomit but comet, the vomit call, comet. The vomit comet. You take some Dramamine, and it's okay. The experience, though, of weightlessness is unbelievable, super cool, and you're on an airplane, and you just land. I'd kill to be weightless. go into the... I, uh, I, uh, you know, how long? Death like 90 seconds, or...? Uh, each time you get, yeah, about two minute and a half, two minutes of weightlessness, uh, and they do it about ten times. Okay, I'm not doing that. What about you? I'm, I would, I want all of these physical experiences, and I want to defy gravity. And Scott, I'm surprised that you don't want to go into space. You are so curious, and you are so thoughtful with regard to physics and astrophysics and the known I world love and the all unknown the world. Things space has brought us. Space has been this unbelievable achievement. But it's for people like Chuck Yeager. You know, he didn't actually go to space, but like, they're, these are daredevils. You, know, you watch the right stuff. These guys are going up in like tinfoil little <laughs> things. I mean, it's it's really it's for the not for the faint of heart. Often you know? with an Accutron. Watch, and we should point out of on their wrist. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Actron was a big piece of the uh, of the space program. But the so the bounty, you know, things like you know, Tang is a is a very trivial example. But like, but <laughs> yes. the, we spent but billions we of dollars so to get much tang. going to space. Yes. In the same way, we learned so much going to war in World War II that actually informed the space program. And then we learned so much going to space that you know it brought technology back down to us. So the quest to go to space. I love that, but I don't need to go into the cold, uh, inky blackness. Okay, myself. you and I grew up at the, uh, roughly the same period. You didn't remember when Neil Armstrong jumped out and put his foot on the on the no, moon. Though I've seen the clip on YouTube time and time again. What I want to ask Neil deGrasse, what what we should ask Neil about is whether the next generation is as excited to go. Uh, into space as we were when we were kids, or at least it was interesting to us. When you grew up, you wanted to be an astronaut, drive a Ferrari, and marry a beauty queen. I, uh, by, by the way, I'm still stunned you haven't been on an anti-gravity plane doing a, a scotch tasting or no. <laughs> some kind of blended Zero bourbon. You know, yes. I'm going to arrange it for next week. <laughs> Little floating <laughs> globules of scotch you can get <laughs> out of the air. I'm so excited to speak with Neil because of the fact that he comes across as a person that has the answers. He seems to have 
all of the answers for black holes and relativity and all of these things that we question and ponder and think about that just don't really have an answer. And he's a shining star in this world. You think about the people who are running museums, so they're the last people you want to talk to at a cocktail party. And I'm, I've been to several events that he's been at, and you can't get to him. People are pushing famous people out of their way to get to him and talk to him. Uh, what was that like? Was that always in the plan? I can't imagine that it was. It was just kind of a happy accident. Yeah. Also, well, he can along- actually communicate this stuff. I mean, so many people people who, are, who work in that research field don't have those communication skills to kind of bring it back. And it's so incredibly important you know, now more than ever, we need we need scientific thinking if we're going to solve some of the biggest crises that we face. It's and the old science is the only it. way out of a lot. We of need this to stuff. understand it. Kids need to understand it, and uh, part of his mission is explaining that to people who ask him, but also to audiences who buy his book. He has a book that's been out that's now coming out in 3D, uh, where we can actually sort of see the whole thing. I'm going to ask him whether Pluto's in there or not because I'm still <laughs> mad at him that he took Pluto away from us. Uh, but get salty, Bill. <laughs> Pluto's a planet. <laughs> I swear. Get over it. Oh. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson on the Accutron Show right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com, and discover our Accutron DNA collection. Reimagined for a new generation, the Accutron DNA combines breakthrough technology, precise engineering, and modern aesthetics to achieve a new level of technical excellence. The Accutron DNA, the new face of time, for those who blaze new trails. Neil deGrasse Tyson, welcome to the Accutron Show. I guess my first question is, is there intelligent life out there, and would you want to go and find it? Yeah, uh, all evidence suggests that after long searching, there's not even intelligent life on Earth. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we prove that on the podcast every week. So So, uh, we're still looking. Um, There are two branches. Well, there are multiple branches, but we can split them into two general lines of inquiry. One of them is just the search for life at all, right? So we've got rovers on Mars with their missions planned to the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn because those icy moons are actually kept warm underneath by tidal stress from the, from their host planet, as well as tuggings from other moons. And so there's energy getting pumped into them. They're outside of the Goldilocks zone where water sustains a liquid state all by itself based on sunlight. But if you have other energy sources, you can melt ice and sustain liquid water as is the case on many moons in the outer solar system, everywhere on earth where we find liquid water we find life including the dead sea right i got named the dead sea because the microscope hadn't been invented yet <laughs> so okay. people didn't see all the other stuff that's doing a backstroke in the dead sea but the uh so so the search for life at all is a is a very important branch of astrobiology and uh, we astrophysicists teamed with biologists to pose the questions design the experiments and the, and the engineers help us get there to, to, to pose those questions. The other branch is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. And that is, it has to be tactically different because you're assuming that the intelligence also has technology and wants to talk to us. <laughs> right, these are a lot of assumptions you're making here. And imagine we were communicated by aliens looking, they're looking for other intelligence in the galaxy and radio signals were beaming by and it was the Roman empire. Okay. Surely we call the Roman empire intelligent, but they got no techno. They don't know, even know what radio waves are. So you have to be able to communicate at a time and at a place where the life forms have this capacity. That's a much harder problem to think about and to solve. And do you want to go, do you want to go into space? Do you want to explore? Yeah, yeah, here's the problem. You know, I don't mean to be like a, a pain in the ass about this, but when people today say, I want to go into space, and then they have the billionaire boys club huh. enabling this, um, those first two, the Bezos-Branson trip into space, uh, if you shrink Earth to a schoolroom globe, right, uh, they went the thickness of two dimes above Earth's surface. Okay. And people want to call that space. I'm an 
freaking astrophysicist. Okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> you got to do a little better than that before you're going to convince me that you are traveling into space. Elon Musk did better because his folks actually went into very high orbit. But even high orbit, relative to a schoolroom globe, he went about a centimeter above the surface. So for me, I'd go on the trip if we're actually going somewhere rather than sort of boldly going where hundreds have gone before. <laughs> Send me to the moon, Mars, and beyond. I'll sign up. I, I had the great privilege of actually being um, at Spaceport America for the first Virgin launch and um, got to see Richard Branson's enthusiasm. Don't you think we need the enthusiasm to break further away from the planet? Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. You just, well, just, I want to be clear. You ask my opinion about what I want to do, but I, I, I generally don't even talk about my opinions because I don't require that other people agree with them. Uh. What I, <laughs> unlike it seems like everybody else, <laughs> you can't say anything on social media that doesn't agree with people's opinions, then they attack you. And then I thought, be careful what you wish for. Do you really want everyone in the world to have exactly your opinion? <laughs> what, what kind of world would that be? Now, you what, can what say whatever that? you want here, Neil. We're fine. <laughs> okay. it's true. It's true. In this space. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I see what they're doing as very important. We're seeing the birth of an entire marketplace, an entire industry of space tourism. And, and frankly, I think that should have happened decades ago. If we had the ability, we could have done this. Um, but it took this long for a variety of geopolitical reasons. But yeah, and yeah, the seats are expensive. As any new thing is expensive, all right? The first people to fly in airplanes were millionaires, all right? That, because it was an expensive thing to do. And my favorite reference here is we all saw the movie um, Wall Street from 1987, and there's Gecko, all right? He's really rich, and he's walking on the beach with a <laughs> telephone that has no wires on it. <laughs> What? It was a, a shoulder-mounted <laughs> cell phone. I was. It was a thinking, cinder block. <laughs> it was a cinder block, and I remember thinking, "Wow, that's cool. I wish I was rich and I could do that." And then, of course, when the when the products first come out, before they're fully commoditized, they don't really work very well. They're clumsy. Now there are three billion smartphones in the world, and so that's so I can imagine a day where the cost of the seats drop. Uh, incrementally, and the demand, as we say in economics, is elastic, the evidence has shown. So what it means is if you drop it by a little bit, a few more people come in mm. to the, uh, in, into the d demand stream and get it down to maybe 10 grand, five grand. I would save up what I would have spent in multiple vacations to Disney World, let's say. The Disney World's expensive. You got to fly there. You got to right. rent a hotel, pay admission fee, buy the hot dogs, whatever. A family of four, you do that. It's five grand, something like that. That's true. I'd, I'd be happy to save a few vacations and then spend that on space. I would do that, or buy a lottery ticket for the chance to get a seat. On, on yeah, I would. I would totally do that. So that's a we're, we're witnessing the birth yeah. of a new industry, and I think that's that, that's a beautiful moment. When we see things like innovations like air travel and, and the phone, there's a huge practicality element to those things. Do you think there's a practicality piece to space that will ultimately sort of come into play? Is there a practicality to the, the frog ride in Disney World? <laughs> <There's no. laughs> well, so it's purely I mean, a thrill. I, you know, you know is, is there a practicality to binging on, on Rick and Morty? I mean, there's, it's entertainment. <laughs> And we have, all, as a culture, we have always valued entertainment. As you may remember or have read, during the Depression, attendance at movie theaters went up, okay? People didn't have money, but you had money to entertain yourself. So I see it as entertainment. And if you can slip some science in along the way, <laughs> I could do I, I'd be okay with that. And the way that would and could happen is access to space becomes so routine that the next science project I can think of is now made much cheaper because of the commoditization of that as an activity. And now I can piggyback, I can send a friend, say, take this experiment with you. And no one will even know or care that it, because everything else is set up to get you to space in the first place. It seems like so, one of the big- Yes, there can be great benefits of this. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's, it does seem like there's a, there's not just the cost. It's it costs billions now, or you have to be a billionaire to go. But there's also this energetic cost. No, just a uh, hundred millionaire. But, well, <laughs> but but the energetic cost of getting there right now, it's this this giant carbon footprint. You know, to to get out, out to space is. It seems like until we have a energetically effective way to get up there, it might not be the greatest idea. Well, so uh, so the carbon footprint. There's a lot of places where you would find a carbon footprint, like in the manufacturing of the things that go into the vehicle. I can tell you two things. One of the great advances that Elon Musk has led that NASA never even gave thought, really not much thought to until the shuttle, and even then it was not successful, it didn't meet its own success goals, is the reusability of spacecraft. Okay, if you fly to Europe in a 777, Boeing 777, you don't get off the plane and then they junk it and roll out a new one for you to fly back. They reuse it. They reuse it many times a day, certainly a dozen times a week. And that drops the cost, the per launch cost, given the whole infrastructure that's there anyway to build these things in the first place. So um, you'll drop the cost. Now, you're worried about the fuel that it's burning to go up into space. There are different kinds of rockets. We, there's a hydrogen oxygen rocket. Okay, the, the, the orange tank on the space shuttle, that simply had hydrogen and oxygen in it. You merge them, what is the byproduct? Water, okay, <laughs> plus a lot of energy. So when you want to think about carbon footprint, not all sources of fuel have the carbon footprint you might be thinking. So the, that's not the barrier here. Um, the barrier here is, um, do they have the enthusiasm to continue? Plus there's an anti-billionaire sentiment going around. And I think it's, it's, it can be unpacked. You, it, you don't have to like the billionaire. Uh, well, well, uh, some don't like some billionaires because of how they treat their employees and their industry. A perfectly legitimate concern. I don't want to take that away from anybody's anger with the billionaires. But the billionaires could be doing all kinds of other things with this money that would not be so interesting. Like they could be they could be in a contest to see who builds the biggest yacht, okay? I mean, <laughs> be careful what you wish for, saying, I don't want the billionaires uh, using money in space. we got problems here on Earth. I, I don't trust, I, I'm glad they're putting them in space because there's some very obvious benefits that can come from that, whereas what billionaire has the biggest yacht, not so much. Well, you, you make a good point with the, the rich people were the first people to travel uh, on airplanes, and they seem to be the early adapters for everything that just want to be able to say, I was the first to do it. When do you think at a and, reasonable... Wait, and, and the first thing they adopt to do it is not as good as what follows. Right. Okay? No, no, that's a great point. You're you right go to about... your rich friend's house, and they have the huge flat panel TV <laughs> that costs them $25,000. Right. right? Now it's like a practically an impulse item at, at Walmart. Okay, you want, you want a 50-inch flat panel? Right. <laughs> this is a bonus for showing up today? You there want paper is. or plastic or a 50-inch panel with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so my question, though, directly uh, about your time frame. So when do you think for five or $10,000, if you were pus pushed for a date, when do you think we're all going to space? What would you guess? I, you know, 20 or 30 years. That I, far? Uh, I just did a study on stuff that happens over 30-year time frames, and it is head spinning, all right? And I'll just give a couple of examples of this. Um, if you go from 1900 to 1930 and ask what were people talking about in 1900, they were riding high on the fact that they had just invented a, uh, an internal combustion engine automobile, and uh, uh, airships were were crossing the country and steamships were crossing the Atlantic and railroad had made the country smaller. They were riding high. And I have a quote from an editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle on the dawn of the 20th century. And he says, I can scarcely imagine that advances in transportation in the 20th century will be as great as those were in the 19th century. <laughs> so this guy's a complete idiot having no understanding of the progress of science, technology, engineering and the attendant math that goes with it. Because three years later, the airplane would be invented. By 1930, we would have flown solo across the Atlantic in an airplane. And the Wright brothers distance that they first flew, 120 feet, happens to be the wingspan 
of a 757 airplane. <laughs> okay. So, and by, and by 1930, cities were electrified. You couldn't give away a horse, a horse that built our civilization for thousands of years. All of a sudden, became, I don't want a horse. Give me the automobile. That all happened in those 30 years. Then from 1930 to, oh, by the way, we also had a world war and a pandemic that took out 100 million people. Okay, so then 1930 to 1960, what happens there? Okay, by 1960, we have like television, okay? Oh my gosh, we went from radios being floor-mounted furniture to televisions, okay? And movies are now in color and they have sound, which they didn't have really in 1930. So what, oh, oh, by the way, there was another world war was fought. Okay, pull that aside. Um, 1930 to 1960, 1960 to 1990? What happened? Oh, 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 by the way, no, no, 1930, 1960, we broke the sound barrier. And we and put we, in a satellite in orbit. Yeah, in we got rockets, right? Yeah. Oh, all of that happened in that period. <laughs> and I'm almost done here. I know I'm just dragging on. <laughs> 1960 to 1990, what happens? Oh, we put up the Berlin Wall because of the Cold War. Oh, 1989, it comes down again. Well, we have a whole Cold War that we go in on and come out of. Oh my gosh, and what happens? Computers go from room-sized machines used by the military and by scientists to something that sits on your desk, on everybody's desk. Oh my gosh. Oh, and by the way, what happened over that period? We sent nine missions with 27 astronauts to the moon. Oh, okay. All right, now, 1930 to 20, 1990 to 2020, what happens? The internet, oh my gosh, <laughs> social media, oh my gosh. Everybody has a high resolution video camera on their hip, which greatly disappoints me that we don't have better video footage of visiting aliens that everyone wants to be out there. <laughs> Three billion In smartphones. Alabama. We, we are crowdsourcing visitors to earth just by everyone having this capacity. And no, the best people put forward is fuzzy monochromatic video taken by Navy pilots in restricted <laughs> airspace. What's up with that? I don't know. But wait, for, wait, let me just stop you for a second. With the right technology, do you think we would see people from other planets here or not? You if don't they're there they're, and they have a don't camera and here. a high resolution video, yes. I, I don't see why not. Unless there's some invisible energy field that no one can see, well then you can't see it and let's get on to the next problem, okay? If aliens really didn't want to be seen, we're never going to see them because if they had enough technology to get here, they're way more advanced than us. Okay, so just just ask some basic questions there. The only point of that exercise, this timeline, is to say it's now 1920, uh, 2020. I have no idea what 2050 will look like. It is a is a fool's errand to even think you have any idea what the next 30 years will bring. So I can imagine that space travel will be routine based on the vectors that are taking us there now. But I, I, I'm not going to be that guy who in the 2050, they go back, here's what Tyson said in the year 2021. Isn't that hilarious? I'm not going to be that guy. You just directly addressed the passage of time, but you've now spent 25 years at the Hayden Planetarium. And through that time, you've shifted from being an academic to being some, a public figure that makes people excited about space. How did, you, how did that transition happen? How did you become so well-known, the, the most well-known astrophysicist? I was telling these guys before you came on that I've been at cocktail parties where they push Robert De Niro out of the way to get to you. <laughs> and, and you are, you're, you're a, he's right, you're a superstar now. How does okay, that? Okay, yeah, so the, over that 25 years, a lot has, has happened uh, in my life for sure. Uh, over that time, the uh, oh, so how I, I, I never I didn't seek any of this out. Uh, all it, I'll tell you what it was. It's very simple. Okay, before I was very well known, um, you go on an airplane and you sit next to somebody, and they say, oh, "What do you do? What do you do?" Okay, so I say, well, "I'm an astrophysicist." Really? Oh, I have all these questions about black holes and and Einstein and God and all of this, and so I'm replying to them, and I'm monitoring. Or, or did their eyebrows go up or down? Am I boring them or is it exciting them? And I'm keeping track of what I say and it's and the response that people have to it. And I say, well, if I want to be effective at this, I should keep track of what I say that's effective and what I say that is not. 
And so I continued this. And I noted that when I got interviewed for documentaries, they would come back for more. I live, I live in New York City where the news gathering headquarters, I get interviewed and then they come back for more. And so I said, okay, I guess this is working. Let me keep doing just that. And then with the rise of social media, I thought I have this knowledge about the universe. I'd be irresponsible if I did not share it. And so on social media, I share this and I watch people's responses. If I think I'm saying something funny and nobody laughs, okay, I make a note of that. If I think I'm saying something insightful and nobody gets it, I, I make a note of that. And so one of the highest compliments I can get is when people came up to me after I've been on Jon Stewart's Daily Show many times and said, you're, you're such a natural and you have such good chemistry with Jon Stewart. Oh, they have no freaking idea what I did before my first appearance on Jon Stewart. I timed how long he would let his guests speak before he jumped in with a comedic comment. And I said, if I want to get a whole thought in, I better tighten it down to that. Otherwise it dangles we got to wait for the joke and now everything's all scrambled. So I would do this and I would get a sense of who his audience is and that's what I would bring to the interview. And then people say, oh, you're so natural. Oh, it's so good chemistry. That's, I guess that's a compliment, but the work that I put into this is what you're seeing. Well, it seems like that work is the kind of thing that doesn't typically get done by people in your profession. There seems to be this sort of mismatch between having the horsepower behind the thinking and then, you know, being able to communicate it. Yeah, the problem is my fields, scientific fields in general, are not rewarded for investing that level of time. You know what else is in there? I spend some time studying, not studying, but becoming aware of forces operating in pop culture. Right. So because if I'm going to talk to you and if I can draw examples from pop culture, then I didn't have to tow you to a place where you can understand what I'm going to say because you're already there. That's the definition of pop culture. I don't have to explain who Beyonce is. I don't have to, <laughs> you know, there, 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 there are things that everyone collectively knows, even if you're not a fan of those people. We all know who Whoopi Goldberg is, even if you've never watched The View, right? And so I have these reference points that are always available to me and they accumulate with every new movie that's a hit movie. I'm going to watch that movie in case there's a, a reference point that I can make. And so the content juxtaposed with pop culture and on my podcast, Star Talk, we bring in humor. My co-host is always a stand-up comedian. And that trinity there, the science, pop culture, and humor, we have found in, in my life of experimenting that people, when exposed to the learning in that context, want to come back for more. And that's what's been happening over the years. So it's been a slow growth. There was no overnight anything. Even when I hosted Cosmos, there was a little bump. But I, you can track this. And it's been slow, and I've been able to adjust. You mentioned before about the Internet you know, kind of coming up, and it seems to be this strange sort of almost anti-scientific backlash happening. You know, I feel like science is one of the few things that's actually going to get us out of any these messes that we're in. These things should not be controversial, the various scientific things about viruses or the climate or other things should not be controversial, but somehow they are that scientific thinking will get us out. And you're one of the few people who seems to be able to actually communicate these ideas. Well, uh, how do you feel about being the future of humanity <laughs> <laughs> and being responsible for the planet? Basically. Towing. <laughs> <laughs> or Atlas had the, the world on his back. Uh, so let me just unpack what you said there. The, um, I don't know if there's a science backlash. Uh, there probably is, but let me give an, an example of why that might not be the case. I think there have always been people among us who are anti-science. They don't want uh, pointy-headed science, Ivy League, Ivy Tower intellectuals telling them what to do in a damn free country. The difference is in the era of social media and the internet, they can find each other. And when they find each other, then they become this unit. And so I don't know if the people occupying this anti-science faction is larger or smaller or the same as it was before. It could very easily simply be the same, but now they have a platform. So that's my, my first comment. Second, um, I try when I post 
especially on my Twitter stream, which is my primary feed for social media. I, I post to Instagram and Facebook as well, but not as not with not the regularity and the precision with what I post on Twitter. I, I, what I post on Twitter, I hardly ever put an opinion there because social media is exquisitely designed for people to attack each other based on their opinions. And like I said, if it's odd that we've created a world where you express an opinion and someone will fight you because your opinion doesn't agree with theirs. I can't think of a more unhealthy state of civilization than that, lest everyone have exactly that opinion, right? Well, that's the only way you'll make that person happy with everybody has that opinion. That's weird. All right. Neil, I can't tell you how you wrong you are. Share different opinions. I can't, so I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how wrong you are. No, uh, you talked a <laughs> moment ago. You talked a moment ago about bringing people back and coming back. Uh, we're going to come back after a break. We're going to talk about some of the other things you're doing now, including writing a book uh, that's coming out, and also some of the television shows you've been involved with besides the John Stewart show. And also, okay. Scott brings up a good point. There are a lot of eggheads out there. You're, there must be a couple of colleagues that bore you. Uh, we want to hear who can't stand, who, who you can't stand to have in the room. Uh, hopefully it's not the three of us. When the Accutron <laughs> show comes back right after this. All right. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com and discover our legacy collection. Reviving some of the most memorable Accutron watches from the 60s and 70s, the legacy collection combines timeless design with the technical excellence of Swiss watchmaking, each limited to 600 individually numbered pieces. The Accutron Legacy Collection, inspired by the past, built for the future. We're back with Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about space. Is it the final frontier? What's out there? What will we never know? That, let, let, let's start with that. What do you think we're never going to know, Neil? Uh, I don't know what we'll <laughs> never know. But I can tell you that as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. Because it's growing into ever more uh, uh, un Un, untrodden territory, right? So, for example, when we designed the Next Generation Space Telescope, now known as the James Webb, which will be launching fall 2021, um, there are questions that we have posed for that telescope that we didn't even know how to pose before we had gotten to where we are through the Hubble telescope, just for example. So every next rung on a ladder that we ascend we see farther than we did before. And then this enables us to ask new questions. What I lose sleep over is not whether there's some questions we can't answer. It's whether there are questions we will never know to even ask. If you could wave a wand and, and know one of these, uh, something that is currently unknowable, what, what, would, you, uh, what would you magically uh, know? Or, or, I wouldn't say unknowable, I would say currently unknown. I, would, I, I wonder, whether the human intellect is sufficient to actually figure out the universe in which we live. That this is, is, is it the very question, is the universe knowable to the human brain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does you seem know, like that. We've, so we've, humans are intelligent and who, de who, who determined that? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So, so out of is that enough intelligence right. to f figure it out? We're, I don't know. We're all on a need-to-know basis. Know. We're, we're all sitting here on a need-to-know, and, and <laughs> maybe we don't need to know everything. Well, it does feel like sometimes that we're bumping our heads at the top of our perceptual abilities. Our brains can only sort of comprehend. We tend to think in three dimensions. We tend to think in these, these ways that evolution kind of brought us to this you know, amazing moment of having consciousness, self-awareness, but like that we then hit up against things like quantum physics that don't seem to make sense to us. Yeah, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us. <laughs> so the whole point of science is to find out how the universe works, regardless of your opinion about that. This is, this is what distinguishes science from everything else. <laughs> science is true whether or not you believe in it. Right? <laughs> yes, the particle disappears from here and shows up there. And sometimes it's a wave and sometimes it's a particle. And that sh famous Schrodinger cat is simultaneously alive and dead. And you say, that doesn't make sense. 
the universe doesn't care. This doesn't make sense to you because our senses arose from the plains of the Serengeti, and all you need to care is, is the lion going to eat you or not? Right. And all the rest of these complex thoughts about infinity, about infinitesimals, about deep time, all of that came later with the methods and tools of science. So when you're worried about we don't have the perception, yes, we do. We have all manner of scientific tools and instruments that can see the universe in ways your five senses can't. The human physiology, as you know, we wouldn't trade it for anything, remains feeble in the presence of machines that can do everything we can do, but vastly better. I'm curious if we these are- We admitted our failures when we said, oh, I can't smell that, bring in a dog. <laughs> a whole, a whole other species. <laughs> Right. Smell the bomb, please, because I can't. That's an admitting saying, I'm a human, and my sensory perception is not as good as some other animals in the world, and is definitely not as good as detectors that I can build. I'm curious if these are some topics that you touch upon in your forthcoming book, Welcome to the Universe in 3D. Oh, so I have to, I have to say that in the right voice. You say, Welcome to <laughs> Wow, that's good. Can you say this is, the, uh, is CNN? Yeah. <laughs> I can have, right? This is Accutron. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, that's going to cost us way too much money. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we do want to know about the book, though. You got to tell us well, about thank you. the book. Th thank you for, for bringing that up. Just, just, just now, uh, a new book uh, has come out, which is a collaboration with two Princeton colleagues of mine. I spent some years there, and we invented a class, never been taught before, which was an introduction to the universe. And of course, there's one of those on every campus. But this was a little different, because we were able to put our own sort of personalities into it and cherry pick a formal curriculum you might find elsewhere and just put in really cool science. And we wrote a textbook. Uh, it's Michael Strauss and Rich Gott, uh, both on the faculty at Princeton. They're still there. I became the director of the Hayden Planetarium over that time. And we wrote a textbook, but it was very a readable textbook. It wasn't, I need information, I'll open a page. It's like, let me read this. That's kind of fun. That's kind of cool. And that was so successful. The publisher, Princeton Press, said, why don't we make like a pocket version of this? So what started out even as our favorite parts of the universe taught in an introductory course, now we cherry pick that. And I just happened to have a, a, an early copy of it. It's right here. It's a it's, my, my hand is the size of the book. So it's, it's a literal pocketbook. I don't know if anybody makes those anymore. This is, this is, it is, it is the, the, the tastiest, chewiest stuff you've ever wanted to know in the universe, from Earth out to time travel, multiverses, and it's, it's all there. And it's all in a, in a, in a, in a package. And we're, we're delighted by it. We're all quite proud of it, actually. But Neil, Neil, I forgot why I was mad at you. Is Pluto in the book? You Don't took Pluto away from us. <laughs> Don't get in fact, still there. In fact, there's a whole chapter on Pluto. Okay, okay. <laughs> deal with it. Deal with it. Because okay? so I knew there'd be people like you out there who who have never gotten over it. And so I, I lay out the argument and recognizing what might be your emotions on this, but I lay out the arguments. And I think by the end of the chapter, you, you're in the right camp. Okay. My daughter brought that up to me when she heard I was going to be talking to you. She said, yeah, d uh, d give him a piece of your mind about that. And I said, look, if you like Pluto, basically Pluto was just this hunk of rock out in the space. Most of the rocks in our solar system don't get any attention. And Pluto okay, has, so, just, so has all this love. You. Pluto had its Pluto is minutes. mostly made of ice. Okay. <laughs> in fact, if you brought Pluto to where Earth is right now, heat from the sun would evaporate that ice and it would grow a tail. See, Pluto is embarrassed. It's an embarrassment <laughs> among planets. Okay, <laughs> not only that, Pluto, Pluto's orbit is not only tipped thirty degrees out of the plane of all the other orbits. Its orbit is so oval it crosses the orbit of Neptune. No, no planet. That's no kind of behavior for a planet. This is why people love you know, Pluto. You know, who does, you know who does cross orbits of other planets? Comets do. And guess what they're made of? Ice. But people like love Pluto. the ugly the puppy in the litter, you know? <laughs> yeah. Here it is. It was the pipsqueak planet, but now it's like the king of the Kuiper belt of other dirty ice balls in the outer solar system. <laughs> dirty the largest ice of its own kind. 
I think it's happier there. So I, Walt Disney and Neil deGrasse Tyson put a tail on Pluto, basically, is what now, you're saying. Now, I'm going to bring in Walt Disney. Okay. This was all happening, and Disney's <laughs> monitoring this, because Disney has Pluto the dog. Right. And when the official vote was taken among my colleagues reclassifying Pluto as a dwarf planet, Disney issued a press release. <laughs> and that press release was issued by, I think it was Mickey Mouse, talking about the seven dwarfs, okay? And it said, we are happy to allow Pluto to become the eighth dwarf. Oh. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> you, can, you can look it up. It's an official Disney World press release. And, and so Pluto in the Disney pantheon is the eighth dwarf. So if, if, if Disney can handle it, so can you. Uh, Neil, I have a question for you about Fair watches. Uh, you know, we're, we're the Accutron show. We talk about watches. And Accutron was associated with the space program. Um, and we were in a space plane, the X-15. Um, but I started thinking about this. And, you know, we put these clocks into... Wait, just to clarify, because not everyone knows what a space plane is. It's the idea that you can leave Earth not in a vertically facing rocket, but you can take off as an airplane, go into orbit, and then come back out. And so the shuttle was an approximation of that because it went into orbit as the orbiter and it landed uh, by itself. But you want to be able to take off as well. And so a space plane, that's what that is, just for your audience. Who might Can you know. be on the podcast every week and explain <laughs> what Scott is saying? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, there were Accutron clocks in the X-15 space plane. And it made me think, like, the... Einstein twin experiment or the, the thought experiment about like what happens when you twin send a paradox, twin paradox they call it the twin paradox right well is, does the same thing apply to clocks and does that make clocks aboard spaceships strange yes yes and let's give the extreme example of that so two things that will change the rate at which a clock ticks one of them relative to you on earth's surface so one is how fast is it moving and the space plane moves pretty fast another one is how far away from the source of gravity is it found. So we, we weigh a certain amount on Earth's surface, but the farther away you go, you weigh less and less and less. The, 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 the gravity field on you is less and less and less. GPS satellites orbit somewhere five, 600 miles up. They are in a lower gravity field than we are. As such, the timekeeping on GPS satellites, and this applies to the Accutron on a space plane, but more so in what I'm describing. The clock, the timekeeping on that is so influenced by Einstein's general theory of relativity that it has to pre-correct the timings before it sends it back to us on Earth when it hits our cell phones and our GPS receivers. So it's built into the correction of that. So they, their time is ticking faster than ours is, and they have to subtract from it before it reaches us. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. So does wow. it still make sense to, when you have a clock aboard a, a spacecraft, you know, th like it's independent, you can't, it probably doesn't make sense to bring a uh, atomic clock there so you can have sort of absolute Oh, it doesn't time. matter what the clock is. It's everything. It is, it is happening in the space-time continuum. So, so your even the cesium rate, would be vibrating at a different rate. It, the, the clock, the, the atoms, all phenomenon, uh -huh. it's that the Einstein's relativity doesn't just affect accutron clocks. Okay? It affects the entire... They'll be crushed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it affects the entire environment. And so, so what you would need to have is to know how fast you're going relative to Earth and then a, a jigger a clock that keeps slower or faster time depending on what equations tell you if you want to know what time it is back on earth right okay? to stay in sync with earth right okay. if you want to know if you're going to age faster than your twin <laughs> or slower than your twin i'm Either going where it's slower happen. yeah hey uh, you mentioned movies earlier did you see the martian with uh, matt damon a couple of years ago who, who are you talking who yeah, <laughs> what, 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 what did what you, you think what why who were you okay i'm sorry were you on the set you know carl sagan <laughs> carl sagan was on the set of contact and did you know this? And Jodie Foster told me, and every night he like held classes for everybody to learn uh, about what they were filming. Have Excellent. you done that? Have you ever... Then they can get more motivation as actors to, to, to put into their role. Have you so done no, that? I was have not you, on the set have, have of you the visited? Martian, but Sorry? Here's, here's my connection to the Martian, okay? Remember I told you my other high compliment that someone said I was just being natural when I actually busted my ass to 
be natural <laughs> in my interviews. So in this, Andy Weir, the author of the novel from which the book was derived, told me that when he started out as an engineer turned novelist, he said when he was writing the novel, he imagined that a little sort of version of me was sitting on his shoulder looking at what he was writing. <laughs> and he said, damn, I better redo this calculation because if Tyson finds this <laughs> after publication, <laughs> he's going to tweet about it. <laughs> so a lot of what was correct in there was motivated by the author's fear that I'd come after him once the book was published. <laughs> If you could go to Mars for a year and only take two people, who would they be? I'd take my two kids. Oh, yeah. Well, they'd have to agree. I'm not going to drag them. <laughs> it's not a hostage. We're going to Mars. <laughs> not a <Duh>. hostage situation. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, so if not them, then uh, my brother and sister. There are three siblings there. And if it's just two, I'd, I'd take my wife, of course. Yeah. Have you found uh, seen any of the uh, Foundation series yet? No, not yet. I know it's just come out. I haven't seen it yet, but it's on my list, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, I was curious. Because you're working yeah, on the, the Isaac Asimov, the Foundation trilogy uh, that, that went beyond the trilogy. And finally, it's got the budget it deserves to create a, a cinematic storytelling of it. Um, you're working on a video game. Is that right? Oh, so so some years ago, there was there was an attempt to try to... And it's still going, and the, the, the people who were... The, the leaders of that were trying to organize and I was sort of collaborating with them and then like COVID hit. So we have to sort of resurrect that. I don't have an update on it for you, but thanks for mentioning that. I'm curious right. if what brought you to astrophysics is what keeps you in it. Is the love still there? Is there a oh, love? Yeah. Was there a light bulb moment that? Oh yeah, so, 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 so the love is still there. It's not because I'm loving the same thing. It's because what I loved at age nine is vastly greater. And it continues to increase with the innovations and inventiveness and cleverness of scientists and engineers. So, so it's a ever uh, growing uh, sphere, uh, ever growing universe of of what it is to love. And as Carl Sagan once said, "When you're in love, you want to tell the world." So, this is a uh, that is all still there. I have no no. If I have more enthusiasm to share the universe than I ever did before well you shared it with this most recent book and several books before that and i have seen you at i was wasn't kidding i have seen you at uh functions uh and people just want to talk to you just like we do they have so many questions and i wonder who's the most interesting person that's ever come up to you and said i have a question about the black hole or uh <laughs> so so i just want to make a, a, an important point there as an educator that's the ideal encounter with someone, okay? Uh, so what happens in the fame world is for whatever is our urge to want to be near famous people, some of it might be deeply genetic, historic, who knows? But it's, it is a weird fact, this concept of fame. There, if you see a famous person, you just want to be near them and like take a picture with them. And there's some of that in my fan base, but as an educator, what I value most is if someone, you know, pause their way to me and says, are you Tyson? I say, yes, yes. I have a question about black holes. And, and then I realize they're not after me. That I, I'm just some spread of food for them to draw from to further enhance their knowledge, intellect, wisdom. And so I have no hesitation being a conduit to the cosmos for all who are interested. Because the moment you become the destination, that's like cult building. And that's not being an educator. That's being something else. It so, reminds me of the end of The Martian. I don't mind it if people like hack their way to me to, to start asking more questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just was wanting to say that you've been very uh, generous with your time. And it reminds me of the very end of The Martian when he comes back and he's lecturing to all those kids. And then he says, any questions? And every hand goes up immediately. <laughs> they all just so, want to know to, more. And we're no exception. It's my most interesting encounter with a, a famous person. So I was at a, at a party. Uh, an app, it, it was a, an indie film just got screened. And some of the actors in the indie film were at this reception. And, you know, good indie films have marquee actors who will help out, you know, and move the, the early projects of young filmmakers. I'm always delighted when this happens. Well, um, Meryl Streep was in that movie. Very low-budget movie, but it, was, it told a story of science. And so she's in the reception. And so 
So I go up to her, because she's Meryl Streep, for goodness sake. So at least I want to, like, greet her and shake her hand and comment on her performance in the film. So I go to greet her. I say, um, hello, Meryl Streep. He says, wait a minute. You're famous. <laughs> she said that to me. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I know. You're famous. That was, like, so cute. I mean, that was the cutest thing ever when Meryl Streep said that to me. But, no, she didn't ask a question about the universe. Um, in that moment, that's what you would ask. But that was that was one of these celebrity moments that I cherish. I have another question about watches. While we're, I'm, I'm a little obsessed. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you, you hear it said that that the fourth dimension, you can think about it as being time, and yeah. so that that watches are sort of this way. You know, we have we can pinpoint our location on the Earth, and we can pinpoint our location even to some degree, you know, in space, but that then watches allow us to kind of mark where we are in time. Uh, what happens when you go to a fifth dimension there, and would it be possible to have some sort of watch, fifth dimensional watch, that would mark you in, in that dimension? I see what you guys are saying about him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'll humor him. Uh, well, <laughs> in the fourth, yeah, anyway. No, you're asking something very deep. So consider that in X, Y, and Z, our three sort of space coordinates, you can move back and forth and up and down and left and right, and nothing, there's nothing there to stop you. Whereas this fourth coordinate called time, we are prisoners of the present, forever transitioning from our inaccessible past to our unknowable future. So that coordinate is very different from the others. So people have wondered, forever people have wondered, will we be able to step out of that timeline and then go left or right within it? Uh, and this is a theme that was treated in uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, the, the main character is abducted by aliens. I always have wanted to be abducted by aliens ever since I read this novel. <laughs> and the aliens, he's, he says, well, um, uh, you know, where, where, where am I? What, what time is it? And he said, oh, there is no time. Time is just this coordinate that you see out there. That's your entire life. Well, I know when I was born. No, you're always being born. Well, I know when I die. I, you're always dying. That is the timeline. In the same way, the couch is always here in the room, but you can move it to another place, and it doesn't matter. You can just re, rejoin it. So you can imagine possibly entering a, a fifth dimension, stepping out of your timeline, and re-entering it at a different place. Okay, the question would be, would you have the knowledge of your fate to go back into that moment and affect it? That could be dangerous, all right? Or is the timeline just writ, writ into the space-time continuum and there's nothing you can do about it, just reoccupy it? Now, let me blow your mind, <laughs> and that is, if space has three dimensions to it, and possibly more if we could ever access them, Maybe time has more than one dimension. Could it be that time has a T1 and a T2, two axes? And if that's the case, you can move a whole other time coordinate relative to the one that we're stuck in. There are people thinking about this, and because we have power, uh, because we uh, uh, mathematics gives us this power of thought that our Serengeti brain would have no capacity to figure out. <laughs> the mathematics takes us there, and that's an intriguing possible future. How expensive will those batteries be for that Accutron <laughs> that can tell time? Oh, you're you're assuming we'd still be using batteries. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, uh, we asked, uh, we said at the break, we we're going to ask you about what's going on for you in the future. What's, uh, what are you trying to do in the next, uh, when you sit down and make the Neil plan, what, what, what do you, what, what, intrigues you in the next few years yeah because I'm, I'm an old fart now right so i so do, do i retire is that you know there's that but generally you retire from something that you'd really rather not be doing the rest of your life but what i'm doing is what i kind of would enjoy doing until i die so it's 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 so so there's a conflict in me in me about the concept of retirement relative to what i'd be doing in retirement but I have several more books that I want to publish before I die. But more important, what I really want to do is make sure there are enough others on the social media and public landscape doing what I'm doing and doing it their own way in their own special 
uh, way that they might interact with people, then I can just slowly back away and then exit the back door where no one will notice, and then I'll go to the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to the Bahamas first, and then I go back to the lab where I can you know, be a scientist again. Uh, I still have some projects I want to complete, but right now I'd be irresponsible if I didn't, I think, if I didn't continue bringing science and rational thinking to a public and to a civilization that I think desperately needs it. But I've seen a next generation come up, and there's a lot of young energy being invested in, in science educators who are internet savvy and social media savvy. And I, so I, I don't mind if I just fade, and no one even knows I'm missing. <laughs> well, you can come back here anytime uh, and talk about anything you want to. Uh, Neil, it has been a real privilege to have you. What you're saying, so after everyone's forgotten about me, you can find me on the beach. And say, you come back? We're coming. Come back. We're coming to the Bahamas, three microphones, a big light, and, uh, and my bring, ties. bring your background with you. Bring that starry <laughs> background. Uh, we, what a, what a, the, the we're thrilled to talk about the book and your future and uh, and ours as well. And uh, when it when it costs ten grand, let's all get in a spaceship and and go for a ride. I think we can do that. I think people who, who go on vacations often save up a couple of years of vacation money. You can you can come up with the ten grand. I'm pretty sure. And if not, like I said, just make a lottery seat, and then every, everybody will participate. You easily raise the money for the person who goes, and then there's the media story about who that person is. Right. That'd be great. I love right. it. Right. Uh, we'll see you in space. We will see you in space. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Accutron Show. To listen to all of our shows, visit AccutronWatch.com. To learn more about the world of Accutron, follow us on Instagram at Accutron Watch and subscribe to our podcast from New York City. Until next time, Accutron Time.